So we're ready to continue our exploration of the theory and practice of tests. Yesterday, we saw the general definition of classical tests, and we also saw something that I can call a factory method to create tests, which is the likelihood ratio test, which is specified here and works when we have what is called the nested model. That means where the, zero, the null hypothesis is a subset of a more general model. We have seen examples of how to apply this to uh, simple uh, paired or non-paired data. A very classical test that is quite often used is the goodness of fit test. So we're getting close to one of the problems I mentioned at the beginning, knowing whether some data comes from some assumed distribution here. So we have a distribution with CDF capital F. We have a bunch of data which are assumed to be ID. And we want to test whether it is true that it has been generated from this specific uh, distribution. There are multiple tests to do that. We'll see several of them. The simple goodness of fit tests relies on binning. Binning means we quantize the histogram of the distribution of the empirical distribution that we have, which means we have a little k uh, quantized values. And I call n sub i for the ith quantized value, the number of data points that fall in this bin here. If the data is truly ID, then the probability that we see a distribution n1 and k is given by what is called the multinomial distribution with parameters qi for bin i, where qi is a probability that one of the samples that we have falls into bin i. So we quantize the distribution and what we test it in fact is not exactly the CDF or the distribution, but the quantized CDF, which corresponds to uh, those values here. Of course, if we have a very small number of data points, the test will not be very accurate. So this kind of test makes sense when we have a fairly large number of data points such that the quantization that we're making here is hopefully not affecting the result. So the multinomial distribution is the distribution you obtain when you have a number of objects. And for every object, you choose one bin to put it. So for the first object, you choose bin i with probability qi. For the second object, you do the same with replacement. And the result gives you the, this combinatorial classical formula that says the probability of this distribution is obtained by this combinatorial factor, which is the number of ways you can see n1 and k out of n objects. And this is the probability of one of these ways uh, obtaining exactly this uh, sequence of choices. here. And the corresponding model of the test is the null hypothesis is that the multinomial variable that we have here comes from the distribution that is here. The, dis the multinomial distribution as parameter n, number of data sample, which here is assumed to be well-known and non-random, and q, where q is precisely given by this formula coming from the distribution capital F, versus the more general model, which assumes that this is a multinomial distribution with any arbitrary distribution p. So p, of course, is a vector of probabilities. So its components are all non-negative, and it sums to 1. So that was the first step. I have designed the test by defining what is the universe. The universe is defined by the distribution of a vector m that is multinomial. The capital theta corresponds to all parameters, to all vectors p. And the h0 corresponds to the case where p is precisely equal to one specific, which is coming from the distribution f. So let's apply the likelihood ratio statistic method. I need to compute the likelihood of an observation. Here is how I'm repeating the probability when the vector is p, the probability of seeing uh, this n1, etc., nk. I take the log of this, and I'm interested in, as usual, 
estimating the parameter p here. So all the other terms here are constants. So my observation in this, when we talk of likelihoods, the observations of the numbers n1, nk are considered as fixed. And what is my optimization variable is p. So if I take the log of all this, I have an ugly term, which is the log of this combinatorial expression. But for me, it's a constant because my variable is only p plus the log of this, which gives the sum of ni log pi. The likelihood ratio method says you have to estimate p under h0. Under h0 is very easy. The estimation of p is q, because there's only one possible value. But you still need to know what is the log likelihood. So the log likelihood is simply this when I plug in q instead of p. Under H1, I need to do the true estimation now. So that is a small estimation problem where we ask the question, I give you a sample from a multinomial distribution. Can you estimate the parameters of the multinomial distribution here? Well, you can do that in various ways. You can, uh, the problem is an optimization problem, maximize some of Ni log P over P subject to this constraint here. So we have a constrained optimization with equality. We can look for a saddle point of the Lagrangian. And with elementary maths that are described in the lecture notes, we find that the optimal is ni over n, which, by the way, is the naive estimation we would do. If I show you uh, the result out of n objects, how many are in every bin, and I want you to estimate what is the probability that an arbitrary object falls into bin i, then the best we can say is, well, the frequency, the empirical probability that we've seen. So that's, again, good news of maximum likelihood, which usually provides intuitive results here. But we need to compute the log likelihood, so we plug this p hat into this, and we find the same constant as before, plus sum of ni log ni over m. The likelihood ratio, now I need to take the difference of this LH1 minus LH0, the constant terms disappear, and we find this sum of ni log ni over nqi. So that's my likelihood ratio statistic. How can I compute the test? Well, one way is to compute the p-value. I could compute a threshold of the rejection region, or I can compute a p-value. Computing the p-value we have seen can be formulated as follows. It consists in computing the probability that a replay sample provides a value larger than the value at hand, the value that we have from our data. There is no simple closed form for that. There are recursive formulas you could obtain, to, but it's very clumsy. So one simple way to do it is to do Monte Carlo simulation. I can I have to estimate the probability. The right-hand side is fixed. This is the things we have from the data. What we simulate is the replay experiment. So I can simulate 1 million or just as many uh, samples as I want of a future replay experiment, assuming the true value would be Q. And I will see how many times I find a test statistic that is larger than the one I have. And this will give me an estimate of the p-value. And we know also that we can even do better. We can compute a confidence interval on the estimate of the p-value that will require us to determine how many replay experiments uh, we need to do. So I did that for this specific example. Mendel's P, this is the very first historical example of this story, uh, which is perhaps at the beginning of two theories, uh, genetics and statistics. So Mendel crossed peas, so the peas, the, the green peas that you eat uh, in the UK in particular, and uh, classif so peas can be of different types. They can be yellow, they can be riddled, etc. So he had different types of peas. He crossed them by fertilizing different plants and classified the results in four classes of peas. If his genetic theory was true, then the distribution uh, in, the four, in the classes should be the following one. So I don't go into the detail of the genetic theory, but you can easily imagine. So he should have found in the first type, which is, for example, a green and non-riddled, 
versus uh, riddled and non green and yellow or or uh, green and here those are the yellow riddled here uh, so those are the theoretical values if his genetic theory is true so he did it experimentally and counted how many he saw this is those are the numbers that he found here so the test is here does not require binning because the data uh, distribution that we have is discrete so here it's a very simple case where the, the binning does not introduce distortion so we do exactly a uh, goodness of fit test the test statistic that we have here has this value I did Monte Carlo simulations until I have a confidence interval that is with 95% probability of the order of 5% of the value that I have. And I found a very large value, in fact, very close to one. Now remember, when p-value is small, we reject H0. Here, p-value is very, very far from small. So we accept H0. We decide that this theory is valid. In fact, if we look at the power of the test, we will find that the p-value is in fact very large and the power of the test is also extremely large, which in some sense is suspicious. If you do a truly random experiment, the probability that you find such a high p-value is very small here. Uh, uh, a p-value as large uh, as this is very, is very small. So there are sus some suspicions from statisticians that the numbers here might have been tuned a bit to, to arrange the theory. But that's another story. OK, so let's move on to a little uh, quiz. We designed a likelihood ratio test with those, uh, the, with the specific null hypothesis being corresponding to a single value of the parameter. We have obtained some data x. What is the p-value? I close the poll in a second. And the majority says A, which is the correct answer. This is a small quiz on the definition of a p-value. In order to define a p-value, we need to put the test in the form test statistic larger than something. And a likelihood ratio test is always of the form likelihood ratio statistic of the data larger than some threshold. So since this is the standard form of a likelihood ratio test, it follows that the, the uh, p-value is the supremum of all over theta in H0, but there's only one, is the probability that another replay experiment gives you a larger statistic than the one you have at hand. So it's important to remember this p-value and also to realize here that at least in simple cases like this one, we don't need sophisticated math to compute the p-value. We can simply use a Monte Carlo simulation. But we can be a bit more sophisticated because one of the main interests of likelihood ratio tests is that there are quite simple and generic asymptotic results. When the number of data points is large enough, which is often the case in our field, it's perhaps not the case when you do some medical tests with very small data samples, but in our field, this is practically always the case. Then we have very simple results. 
Here is the result. It says that when I do a likelihood ratio test, remember that I have to find two things. I have to solve two optimization problems, solve uh, the optimal estimator of theta when the null hypothesis is true, and also find the optimal estimator of theta otherwise in the generic model. And the likelihood ratio statistics is the difference of the likelihood of the log likelihoods of those two that corresponds to those two estimators here. Well, there is a generic result that says that if P is the number of dimensions that H1 adds to H0, we'll discuss that in a second, then the P value when n is large and when the central limit theorem holds, that is if the distributions at n are like we have discussed already, have a finite variance, then the p-value is approximately equal to one minus the chi-square distribution with p degrees of freedom applied to two times the likelihood ratio statistic. This is a very similar result to what we have seen a few hours ago when we discussed confidence intervals for a maximum likelihood estimation of a parameter when we have done the estimation only numerically. We have had a similar result and it comes from the same uh, theorem that's given in the lecture note. It comes from a Taylor series expansion of the likelihood ratio statistics and that the, the first non-vanishing term, we, which is in square order, will give us uh, this uh, result here. So the important thing to apply this theorem is to know the number of dimensions that H1 adds to H0. Number of dimensions, because remember, we assume here that theta zero and theta are sets of continuous sets of parameters that have a well-defined dimension. In practice, that means those are probably closed uh, sets that have uh, non-empty, that are uh, subsets of R to the power N defined by inequalities of continuous and differentiable functions. And so what we need to count is the number of dimensions of theta zero and the number of dimension of theta. The difference of the two is P. When I say dimension, it is dimension of continuous numbers in the sense of uh, geometry. So here is the theorem in all the, the generality here. which we can rephrase by saying that the number, the likelihood ratio statistic is an approximate pivot. So we are guaranteed that at least approximately, whatever the model we're using, if we use a likelihood ratio statistic, the distribution of it under H0 is, uh, is an independent of the parameter here, which is required to make a, a test that's usable in practice. So let's see what it gives on some of the examples we saw before. So here's a revisitation of my, my example where I want to know whether compiler option zero is better or not than compiler option one. If I assume that I have uh, Gaussian data, which is not violently uh, shocking here, I can say that the model is that the first data set is mu one, a fixed parameter, plus noise, Gaussian noise. And same thing for mu two. Here there's a typo, the J should be in subscript. And what we want to test is whether mu one is equal or not to mu two. So this is a two-sided test. We, we're asking the question, is blue same as red or is blue different than red? We have seen that we could do something a bit different if we a priori hypothesize that red cannot be worse than blue, for example. That's another story. Here, let's assume we, we do this hypothesis. Here, I'm assuming the noises term have the same variance here, which is compatible with what we see here, but there's an important assumption that may need to be taken with care. So that's the test we have. Mu1 equal mu2 versus mu1 less than mu2, different than mu2. So in order to do that, we have to compute the likelihood but this is a linear regression model. In fact, it's a very simple one, uh, but we have seen in the previous lectures that there are closed form for linear regression models with 
uh, Gaussian noise. So I can estimate mu1, mu2 under both hypotheses. And I will find a likelihood ratio statistic that happens to be equal to related to the log of the ratio of what is called the uh, residual errors in this is an example of what is called ANOVA, analysis of variance. We have seen this property already. That is that if we have a Gaussian noise model, the log likelihood uh, is a function of the L2 norm of the residuals, which is sometimes called in software packages like in MATLAB, ANOVA packages is called SS0 for the norm of residuals under H0 and SS1 for the norm of residuals under H1. Here I say under H1, but remember we are, have, we are having the nested model. So SS1 is in reality the norm of residuals in the bigger model that includes H0. So we're really testing whether H0 is true or not. So this general formula is explained in the lecture note, but is available in many references. So that tells us what is the likelihood ratio statistic here. I multiply it by two, so n log SS0 over SS1. That gives me the argument that I have here. I still need to compute the number of degrees of freedom. So for that, I need to reason about my model. What is the general model? The general model, which is here, is given here. How many parameters? continuous parameters do I have in the general model? Well, I have mu1, mu2, and sigma. So the dimension of the generic model is three. The specific model that corresponds to the null hypothesis imposes that mu1 is equal to mu2. So we have only two parameters, mu1 and sigma. So we have two dimensions for H0 here. So the number, uh, the difference is three minus two is one. So I apply the chi-square with one degree of freedom and that will give me the p-value here. So I did this uh, for these uh, three repetition of this uh, experiment. So I have three parameter sets, and I computed the p-values here, and I found those three values. Some are very small for the first data set, some are very large for the third data set, and in, in between for the second data set. And those are the approximate p-values when n is large. Now, if I assume that the, value, the, the values that come here truly come from a Gaussian distribution, we can compute exact p-values. In fact, this is what ANOVA is doing. The exact p-values are possible to compute because in the context of Gaussian random variables like here, we know the distribution of SS0 and SS1, at least under H0, and they come from Fisher distribution. So this is similar a bit to what we did when we have confidence interval for the mean. If we know and we're sure everything is Gaussian, we know we have an exact formula with a student distribution. If we're not too sure about the distribution, we know at least it's approximately normal. So here is the same. We know it's approximately chi-square. And if we're sure everything is Gaussian, we know it's exactly Fisher. So here, MATLAB computed for me the p-values for the same three sets using the Fisher distribution, which are probably more exact. And we see that the values are very close. In fact, they are close up to the almost the third digit when uh, the values are large. They are less close here when the values are very small. But since the values are very small, uh, the results of the tests uh, will be the same here. By the way, if I do those computations, for which of the parameter sets will I conclude that red is significantly different than blue? 
I close in a few seconds. And the majority gives the correct answer. We reject the null hypothesis when the p-values are small. So if we accept the standard value of 5% for statisticians, then we reject the null hypothesis in the first two cases, which means in those first two cases, we reject, we reject the null hypothesis. So we say there is a significant difference. This illustrates, by the way, the difference between a test and a confidence interval. We have seen that in one way to address this would be to compute confidence intervals for the log of the values here on the y-axis for the red and the blue data sets. And we saw that in the first case, the intervals do not overlap. So we can say, yes, they are different, which is also what the test says. In the third case, they do not, they do overlap. So we say, well, they're not significantly different, but here we're not too sure because they overlap, but not too much here. So it is really in the case of parameter set two that the test was able to disambiguate, which is by the way, when the p-value is small, but not very small here. So a test in some sense is, is useful in those boundary cases where you're not too sure and you want to rely on something that gives you more certainty. We use the chi-square distribution in this test. We've used it in, in other contexts too. So the chi-square distribution, of course, is given by all the mathematical packages. For n equal to one, it is simply the square of a Gaussian random variable. And for n equal to two, it's the distribution of the square, the sum of the square of two random variables, etc. And those values, the uh, 95 percentile, for example, or 97.5 percentiles of the chi-square distribution are well-known and very often used. Well, so we have seen uh, what we call a simple goodness of fit test. Why simple? Because we were testing for one specific distribution. Is the Mendel P distribution that I see coming from the distribution that corresponds to the theory? So it's called simple because the null hypothesis corresponds to only one specific distribution. In general, for example, when we want to ask, is this distribution coming from one normal distribution? We're not testing one specific normal distribution, but a normal distribution, which has an infinite set of possible parameters. In a, such a test, in a case, we use what is called a composite goodness of fit test, where we want to test whether a data sequence that we have obtained comes from not one distribution, but a parametric data distribution. So we can do the same as before. We can use bins and compute the number of data points that fall in every bin. And then we simply have similar as before, the global universe is all the multinomial distributions with all possible vectors P and the specific theta zero, the null hypothesis corresponds to the values of p's that I obtain when it is computed from some theta in, that corresponds to this family. So I compute qi of theta as the probability that a random variable that has this distribution of parameter theta falls into bin i. So we can redo the theory as before. Under h0, we need to solve an optimization problem, find the value of theta that maximizes the log of the likelihood. Now the log of the likelihood is a constant plus sum of ni log of qi of theta hat. A qi of theta hat depends on the specific family of distributions we have. This can be solved uh, easily or is more complex depending on the nature of the distribution we're testing. Under h1 is the same as before. I assume that under H0, I find an optimal theta, that is theta hat. So theta hat is the optimal distribution uh, parameter I find if I assume that the hypothesis H0 is true. And then under H1, I find Ni over M. And like before, the likelihood ratio statistic is given by this formula, which is simply the difference of the two here. 
So like before, what we need to find is find the supremum of the probability for every theta and theta zero of a, re a replay experiment producing a test statistic larger than the one we have here. Most of the time it's very difficult to compute this when the set theta zero is general because we have here to take a supremium. So by Monte Carlo simulation, we can produce the value of this for one value of theta. Finding the supremium is a bit difficult. It is doable. There are so-called stochastic gradient descents. I can find that. You can try and try a value of theta, do a few Monte Carlo simulations, see uh, where you're going and try to uh, steer your distribution, your choice of theta based on that. But that is a bit sophisticated and complicated. Instead, what we can do here is use the asymptotic results, right? We know that when the number of data points is large, this is approximately given by this formula. So what we need here is simply to compute two LRS, but LRS is, compu is computed once we have solved for the optimal theta. And of course, we need to find the optimal P, the, the, the number of degrees of freedom. So I did this here. Uh, for this uh, same example, Mendel's P's. We'll see in a minute ago the result of my Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, here, of course, I can do Monte Carlo simulation. In general, I cannot do it. Here is the result of my uh, application of the asymptotic result, which you can say is completely consistent with the Monte Carlo uh, result here. By the way, when I did this, what was the value of the integer p that I had to take here? In, generi in general, I'm using this notation here. I'm doing a composite goodness of fit test where I have k0 dimensions for the parameters that corresponds to the null hypothesis, and i is the number of bins. I close the poll in a few seconds. I may give you a few more seconds. Closing. So I have a very uniform distribution on three wrong answers. So let's see why. We simply need to compute what is the dimension of the universe of the parameters in general and under theta zero. Right? So in general, in general, what is the number of parameters? Well, we have a multinomial distribution with a vector p. n is fixed. n is not a continuous parameter, and is fixed as a number of data points. So the parameter in the general case is the vector p. But p is, doesn't have capital I dimensions, but I minus 1, because we need to pick the number such that their sum is equal to 1. So we can choose only uh, I minus 1 of them. When we say number of dimensions, it has to do with topology. It means each of the variables, I must be able to choose them at least with an interval around any values around them. So I can pick the first value P1. And for this, I don't need to fix the value. It can be anything 
uh, with some variation around any value that I pick. So there is an interval of possibles P1. In fact, P1 can be anywhere between zero and one. Having fixed P1 not equal to zero and one, I also have an interval of values for P2. P2 must be less than one minus P1, etc. So for every value that I have taken, I restrict the choices for the following values, but the choices are not completely restricted. There is still a degree of freedom. There is still one dimension. Dimension. When there is one dimension here, it has to do with the geometric concept of dimension. It means if I draw the set of P's that I have, uh, dimension one means I draw a line. So if I do that recursively, I see that for every parameter P, I have a free choice, except for the last one when I have picked uh, I minus one values, the last one is determined, so I have no choice here. So the number of degrees of freedom here is I minus one, and the number of degrees of freedom for the general model. For the specific model, then it is K zero, which I have to assume is less than I minus one. Of course, if I have, if I am binning in a number, quantizing with a number of bins that is smaller than the number of parameters, uh, probably this will not be very efficient. So I'm assuming it's K0 is less than this. So that is exactly the number of degrees of freedom that H0, uh, that's the general hypothesis adds to H0. So that's the value I will need to apply to, uh, uh, to choose to apply this theory. Let's apply what we have seen to the good old questions that we repeatedly were confronted with of deciding using a test whether a distribution is Gaussian or not, like the one we showed here. Surprisingly, this very important and frequent problem is not so easy. So let's see what can be done about it here. First method, the proponent of this method is Homer. He proposes to bin the data into a histogram with 10 bits, one, two, three, dot five, ten, and uses a simple, uh, and will do a goodness of fit test of the theoretical value versus the observed value. So the observed values is from the empirical histogram. If you ask MATLAB to do a histogram with 10 bins, MATLAB will give you how many of the points fall in each of those bins, and this is what it will give to you. The theoretical values were obtained by Homer by estimating the parameters mu and sigma of the distribution. So how do you estimate? Well, Homer used what MATLAB shows me, which is this red line. I'm not sure how MATLAB does it, but probably MATLAB is simply doing a least square fit of a cloud. So I have a cloud of blue points. I want to fit a red line to it. So I use least square fit of the points here. So this is what MATLAB did. I fitted a straight line to the QQ plot. I obtained those values of mu and sigma, which gives me now the theoretical value. I ask MATLAB for this mu and this sigma, what is the probability that uh, I see exactly, uh, uh, sorry, what is the expected, no, what is the probability that an arbitrary value falls in this bin? And I multiply this by the number of data points that will give me these values that are given on the left here. So we're in the framework of a simple goodness of fit test. I apply this likelihood ratio statistics. I use a asymptotic formula. I need to find the P, so the, the degree, number of degrees of freedom. The, if I have nine bin, 10 bins here, I have nine degrees of freedom for the general model. I have two degrees of freedom for mu and sigma. Therefore, uh, Homer does the chi-square seven uh, and or uses chi-square seven and obtains this p-value here. This p-value is small, not too, too small, but it's less than 5%. Therefore, Homer rejects normality. So Homer says this data is not normal, doesn't look Gaussian. Let's confront this to another method, which is Lisa's method. Well, Lisa, who is usually smarter than Homer, observes that 
he did not truly do a composite goodness of fitness because he first fitted the data to obtain mu and sigma and there compared the data to the fitted distribution, right? So this is not what we saw when we said composite goodness of fit. Goodness of fit. We have to compute the QI that maximizes the log likelihood here. So this is what Lisa did. So under H0, the values of the 10 bits are generated by multinomial with n data points, 10 bins, and Q, that are the probabilities that result once we have chosen the bins from the normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma. Right? This is equal to this. If a bin is an interval, say, for example, between 10 and 20, so if we bin in bin i all the values that fall between 10 and 20, the qi will be the CDF of 20 minus the CDF of 10, the probability that a Gaussian random variable falls in the interval 10, 20. Of course, this doesn't have a closed form, except if you accept that the CDF of the Gaussian distribution belongs to your catalog of closed forms. So it's expressed from this CDF, but this is one that is known only numerically. And as usual, H1 is the arbitrary uh, distribution when uh, the vector Q is arbitrary. So Lisa's job is to fit the model under H0 and H1 and compute the log likelihood. How can we do it? How did Lisa do it? So under H0, the problem is to maximize this function that we have seen before. And as I said before, the QI is equal to the difference of the CDF of the bin if B minus the BIs are the boundaries of the bin here. So that becomes so maximize sum of ni log of this function here. Well, it's an ugly function, but the dimension of the number of parameters is not too large. We have only two parameters, mu and sigma. So in general, um, brute force optimization works for small dimensional problems. This is what Lisa did. She asked MATLAB with fmin search to find uh, the optimum of this. And she found those values here. So she did the same thing as uh, Homer pretended to do, but she did it right by taking the QI from the log likelihood uh, optimization. And you see the, the values are slightly different here. The, slight, the values of the bins are for some very different from the values obtained uh, by Homer. So Lisa continued. Under H1, that's very easy to, to find uh, the values. Uh, under H1, they are simply the proportion that are given here. And we do the likelihood ratio statistic by taking the formula sum of ni log of qi, etc. We apply the asymptotic results. The number of degrees of freedom is seven, like for Homer. Although for Homer, uh, the thing was a bit weird and we could have argued about the seven, but here, we have nine degrees of freedom for the general case, two degrees of freedom for the specific case. So we take seven and she finds a p-value, which is now very different, is 63%, which is large. P-value large means we accept H0 and therefore Lisa accepts that the data is Gaussian and normally distributed here. Yet a third approach, which is the one by Bart, Bart is some, sometimes an outsider. He does things that are sometimes smart, sometimes not, depending on whether he's lucky or not. But one particularity of Bart, if you know the Simpsons, is that he cheats very often. So he cheated on Lisa and copied the beginning of her method. He saw that Lisa's distribution has optimal values equal to that. So he says, well, after all, if I want to test whether this data distribution is Gaussian, let me first estimate using maximum likelihood estimation, the mu and sigma. And then I do a simple goodness of fit test versus this distribution here. So I'm not testing whether it's Gaussian, but I'm testing whether it's Gaussian with these specific values. Then we have the same theory as before. We compute under H0 uh, the log likelihood. Under H1 is the same. Under H0, now it will give a different formula. We apply the chi-square formula with the number of degrees of freedom is now 
nine minus zero. Yeah, there's zero degrees of freedom and there is zero because there is no continuous parameters. So we use chi square two and we find this uh, value here. So we found a p-value here that is different than the true p-value. In fact, it is larger if we uh, compare to the p-value obtained here. And that is a general result. Sometimes we are forced to do Bart's stuff. Bart is cheating because he's saying, I'm not testing whether it's Gaussian. I'm testing whether it is this specific Gaussian. Where does this specific Gaussian come from? It comes from the data. So from a statistical viewpoint, it is wrong to use the data in the formulation of the test because we introduce some bias. But sometimes we do it because there's no other way. For example, if we want, if we need sigma somewhere, we don't know what the sigma is, then we take sigma for the data. The important thing to do to know is that that introduces some error. And in terms of p-values, it tends to overestimate the p-value because we have fitted the value to the data, so we're more likely to accept it than in reality we should here. So that's a generic bias that perhaps we should remember. Voila, that's all for today. We will continue next week uh, saying a few words about other tests that are quite useful and very frequently used. In the meantime, don't forget to, uh, to put your mini project definition. If you have problems uh, we can uh, finding a mini project or if you want to talk, don't hesitate to talk to me. Uh, I'm available in the next two hours for uh, discussions over Zoom. In the meantime, take care. <laughs>